Welcome back. In recent days, you may have heard about the LIBOR scandal, or you may have heard that this man, Bob Diamond, the former chief executive of Barclays, resigned last week. What you might not know is what happened and how this impacts you. And Andrew, give us a quick refresher. Well, Rich, let's start with what LIBOR is. LIBOR stands for the London Interbank Offered Rate. It's a number which is used as a benchmark for various other financial products like student loans, auto loans, adjustable rate mortgages, credit cards, and more. LIBOR is calculated by Thomson Reuters for the British Bankers Association, and it's based on daily submissions from member banks. The submissions from BBA banks aren't based on any actual data. Instead, it's based on bank estimates, and that's where the problems begin. Some banks were reportedly fudging their numbers. The worst offender so far was Barclays. As Matthew Iglesias of Slate Magazine put it, quote, a bank could try to tailor its LIBOR submissions to meet the needs of its trading desk rather than offering good faith estimates, and that's exactly what happened. The number fudging is most colorfully demonstrated in a series of emails between the bank's traders and the people who submitted its LIBOR estimates. In them, there's a clear documentation of traders thanking submitters for changing the numbers. In one email, dated October 26, 2006, a former Barclays trader wrote, Dude, I owe you big time. Come over one day after work and I'm opening a bottle of Bollinger. In another email exchange, dated March 13, 2006, a trader writes to a submitter saying, quote, the big day has arrived. As always, any help would be greatly appreciated. And after the submitter complies, the trader thanks him, saying, When I retire and write a book about this business, your name will be written in gold letters. The submitter responds, I would prefer this not be in any book. At this point, Barclays has been fined $453 million by the U.S. and the U.K. Barclays chairman has announced his intention to step down as soon as a successor is in place. He spoke today at the U.K.'s House of Commons Treasury Committee hearing about Bob Diamond's severance package, and he announced that Diamond would not get his $30 million in bonuses. Well, what has happened is that Bob Diamond has uh, voluntarily uh, decided to forego any deferred consideration, any deferred bonuses, to which he otherwise would have been entitled. Now, don't feel too bad for Diamond. He will still receive a year's pay and a cash payment instead of a pension. Together, that's worth about £2 million, pounds, and pounds, of course, rich worth more than dollars, at least for now. Thank yeah. you, Andrew. And joining us now to break it all down, Anthony Curry, the associate editor of Breaking Views at Reuters. Anthony, thank you very much for a few minutes. I appreciate it. My yeah, pleasure. Okay, for the average person at home, and for that matter, for any company who goes to an investment bank for financing, tell them why rigged interest rates, even in Barclays, as we say across the pond, ought to really get their dander up. Well, I, I think it's, if, if you're actually going as, as a member of the public or just a company, it probably doesn't have a great deal of effect on you, to, to be honest with you. It's a really, really tricky thing to try and explain. Let me put it this way. You've got 16 banks uh, who contribute uh, to London Interbank Offered Rate. Uh, the top four and the bottom four, so the ones who give the, the, the highest and the lowest four numbers, are excluded. Then you put the other eight together and, you, and the BBA and Thomson Reuters together come up with this blended rate. Now, what a lot of the banks, what, what, well, certainly what Barclays has been doing, it seems, is trying to get a slightly lower rate to benefit their traders. So actually, in that sense, if you're someone going out to borrow money, you may well benefit, but only very slightly, because we're talking about a hundredth or two hundredth of, of a percentage point here. So in, ter in, in those terms, it really probably means very, very little for anyone who's going out borrowing money on the street. Where it does affect uh, people is, is uh, well, institutions, is where that trader you were talking about earlier, the one saying, come over and I'll buy a bottle of Bollinger. He's thinking that if I can get this great rate here from, from my guys here at, uh, at Barclays, then I can probably just about manage to mark these, uh, swap deriv these derivative swap transactions I've got at a slightly better rate, which makes me look slightly better for the day, uh, and then I'm great. But the issue is we, we can't actually work out what effect that had on, on the actual LIBOR rate that was then set for the entire market. And that's the real problem here. You know, part of this reminds me, Anthony, for when um we were pointing fingers at the SEC after 2008 here where we were like, where were you regulators? Um, what to you is more uh, really scary about this story, that you can't still trust the banks after everything that went down in 2008, or that we still can't trust the regulators who seemingly knew and did little, if anything, to really curb the practice? Well, I think there's a degree of the emperor has no clothes here. Again, let's go back to how this thing works. 16 banks submit numbers. And those numbers, everyone kind of knows those numbers are based on where they think they can borrow or lend money in the, in the bank market. It's not based on any particular transaction that's been done. It's based on what the banks think they can do. Um, so 
16 banks can do what they want, so everyone kind of knows that. But they, they think, well, we've got this great system in place, which means that we have averaged out the eight middle banks, so it should be fine. Uh, now, that kind of sounds OK, right? Well, we, we, you, there's guesswork involved in a lot of things. How do you price an initial public offering? How do you price a bond deal? How do you work out what anything costs? You ask people. Uh, but yes, if banks start fiddling, then it gets a bit tricky. Now, it doesn't really surprise me that banks are doing this. And let's not forget that Barclays apparently wasn't doing any of this after about 2008, 2009. So the crisis somehow stopped it. Actually, one could argue, actually, that, that to some extent, journalists uh, did it, if we can just uh, bang our own drum here for a bit. Both Bloomberg and The Wall Street Journal came out with articles in 2008 saying something's wrong with LIBOR. Are these guys fixing it? But no one could work out what effect that had on the market. The regulators, absolutely. What are the regulators doing? Well. It seems like uh, the Bank of England, we had uh, Paul Tucker up in front of the House of Commons yesterday saying actually he wasn't looking for Barclays to change uh, its rates. There was an implication that 2008 the Bank of England was questioning why Barclays rates were so much higher than others. Uh, and maybe it was given an implication they should drop it a bit. We're in a financial crisis. We don't want banks to be seen to be in trouble. So don't make it look as if you're finding it harder to borrow money. Uh, which, I mean, we saw that all throughout the financial crisis in other ways. But that was a rather blatant example to some people before Tucker spoke. Um, now, if I can broaden the discussion a bit, we, we had yesterday this uh, very small futures broker on a slightly, on a completely different level, PFG Best, which came out with the news that its uh, CEO and founder, who apparently tried to kill himself, has been fitting the books to the tune of $220 million of customer funds that he's not, uh, he's not kept segregated from his own firm's funds. Very much like MF Global, do you remember they had that yep. problem, the same problem last year. Uh, regulators apparently gave a blessing to, uh, to this firm, PFG Best, just a couple of months ago. So yeah, regulators still aren't catching stuff. Banks, um, banks are still getting away with stuff and fiddling stuff. I think there's a degree of this, unfortunately, that we're going to have to accept. If you put people in charge of lots and lots of money, you're going to get people uh, going into the jobs who want to fiddle the books and think they can get away with it. I guess the last thing for me is Bob Diamond, uh, you know, he said, you know, I find the behavior uh, of my traders here reprehensible. But in effect, he said, hey, all the other kids are doing it. Um, in fact, yeah. they participated with the investigation thinking they got ahead of this thing here. He would be spared. They'd pay a fine. It didn't work out that way. Are we going to find out that Barclays certainly wasn't an anomaly here? Everybody was doing it. They were at least smart enough that they thought they got out ahead of it. Uh, but we're going to find out the other banks here were just as bad. Well, yeah, we've, we've got we've got virtually every other bank being investigated. Of course, you've got three banks in the U.S. which are being investigated: Bank of America, Citigroup, and J.P. Morgan. The one thing probably those three banks have got going for them, well, certainly B of A and Citi, is that most of the people who were around before 2008 are no longer there. So the chances of losing your CEO over this are pretty slim. J.P. Morgan obviously has Jamie Dimon with his own issues. Uh, who knows what will happen there? But. At the moment, of course, there's no, no indication that anything nefarious has gone on there. And of course, you know, Barclays, uh, you know, yet again, traders not learning the, the trick. Right? If you're going to commit a sin, try not to get caught out. It's almost the 11th commandment, isn't it? Don't get caught out. Well, they, it was in emails. It was in text messages. <laughs> I mean, th these guys really haven't learned. I mean, a good job, too. It's glad they, glad they got caught. But they've not learned. We'll see if the other 15 banks have got traders that are as, as, as stupid to commit things to paper. And Nikari, thank you so much from Reuters. I appreciate a few minutes. Pleasure. All right. Uh, Richard, I got a quick question for you. I know eyes glazed over there. I still wanted to do this because this is. You an did the right thing. Subject. I tried, okay? But to anybody at home, says, oh, what do I no, care? No, no, no. It's Tell them why they it's care. It's a big deal. They lied. They lied about interest rates that affect everybody's mortgage, credit card, whatever. And most importantly, it's an insight into a system which may not be just a series of guys going, oops. But if you look at J.P. Morgan, if you look at the drug companies, it may be that the large corporate sector here is fundamentally corrupt. Mm. Now, I'm not mm. saying it is, but I'm saying when you see mm. what we've seen in the past six months with the mortgage banks, with the commercial banks, with the private banks, with the drug companies, maybe it's time to wonder whether all this investigation of uh, guns in Mexico and, and uh, Eric Holder is a sideshow because the real thing that's affecting Americans is a corrupt private economy in which people get away with it, aren't punished, and in the end are rewarded. And to me, just the thing, wherever you fall on this issue, everybody should root for regulation here because nobody should be able to make their own books here, especially when the public uh, concern is at risk. But more than that, where is the chagrin? 
after 2008, I mean, talk about the shortest memories. After everything that went down, you'd figure there'd be a little window of time where people would hide a little low. It seems like nothing has changed. There is no changed. shame. And listen to what Diamond said. Everybody does yeah. it. And that to me was the scariest line does. This is why the yeah. American people have very little faith in many of our institutions. Well, they ought to do something about it in November, yes. but that's my last parting shot.